If you're a photographer, then chances are at some point you'd have come across Adobe's all-in-one photography software, Lightroom. But are you using it as efficiently as you should be? Over the course of the next video, I'm going to be taking a look at a good healthy workflow within Adobe Lightroom. So let's take a quick look at who this video is actually aimed at. If you want a basic introduction to Lightroom, then make sure you check out the video that I've already done over on Wex's social channels. So in this video, we're going to pick up from a point where you're already familiar with the software and how it works. And we'll delve a little deeper into how you can get Lightroom to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. All of this means that you can spend a little bit longer photographing and less time micromanaging your workflow. A good place to start is by saying that if you're not already shooting in RAW, then you really should be. By restricting yourself to JPEGs, you're not getting the most out of the images you're shooting, and you're not allowing Lightroom to do its best work for you. And one more thing to know is that Adobe Lightroom is a completely non-destructive way of editing, which means that it doesn't actually touch your original file. So with that said, let's move on. We'll start by going through the library module and importing your images. With a library module, you'll need to get into a good habit of keeping your images organized. After all, this is the center of your workflow, so it's very important to get this right. You can make Lightroom work for you here by setting a good practice and then making sure you're maintaining it during the import stage. If your folder structure is a mess, then you need to spend a good amount of time organizing it so it works for you. When I came to organize mine, I did this outside of Lightroom, then imported the folder structure. What worked for me was to organize my folders in such a way so I could easily locate any shoot or image I needed to both inside and outside of Lightroom. To get things organized properly, I set my folder structure up with the main theme first. For example, landscape, travel, wedding, or portraiture. Then I created subfolders for each shoot. These I labeled with the date they were shot, followed by a keyword for the shoot. For the format of the date, I stuck to a year, then month, then day format to keep my shoots organized, and then a keyword, for example, the location or name of the subject. Then finally, you'll have all the images from that shoot safely sat within the relevant subfolder. Once you've set up a good folder structure and hierarchy, it's really easy to stick to this going forward. Now we can have a look at importing your images. Compared to the basics video, we're gonna take a little bit longer to take a look at the finer details when importing your images. So insert your card, and as normal, the import window should pop up. If you've not looked at these options before, then now is a good time to pick up an understanding of what each part does. A key box to have checked at this point would be the do not import suspected duplicates box. This makes sure you're not clogging up your drive by importing the same images over and over again. You can also look at the size of the preview built by Lightroom. This option dictates how quickly your preview loads up when going through your images, with one-to-one -one being the fastest and minimal being the slowest. These do, however, have a trade-off on how much space they take up, with the one-to-ones taking the most space of your drive. However, if you go into your catalog settings, you can ask Adobe to delete these large one-to-one -one previews after about 30 days. Depending on the shoot, I'll normally stick with standard or one-to-one. -one. A good practice is to also import your images into a separate drive. Many people do use a backup program for this, but if you're not using something like that, then here is a good time to make that digital copy of your shots. Just tick the box, select the drive you want it to back up to, and you're all set for your import. The next option allows you to name your images here. This isn't something I do with my shoots, as I only feel the need to name the shots after I export. Under the Apply During Import tab, you can tag your images with keywords. So depending on the shoot or type of photography you do, you can add generic descriptive words here. This will help you manage your images at a later date. So for example, as a wedding photographer, you might want to put things in like the location, season, or the fact that it's a wedding, and any other keywords that would describe the full day or images you're importing. Be quite broad here though, as these words are applied to all of the images you're importing in this Go. As well as applying keywords, you can also apply base edits to all the images. So things like applying camera and lens corrections here are useful, or if you're a studio photographer, then you could apply something like a full base edit to your images. This could be based on a previous edit and can be done in batch before outputting them to Photoshop, for example. By applying a preset during the input phase, this means you could potentially cut out a step during your process. Finally, we have the section where we tell Lightroom where to put the images. This is where we build upon the folder structure that we already have in place. If you tick the into subfolder checkbox, you can then name your folder based on your structure and it will create this in your drive and add the images to it. So all that's left to do is hit the import button. And that's the key parts to importing your images. Just make sure you're picking the right tabs that are relevant to you and your workflow. Now that we're back in the library module and you've imported your images, you need to take the next steps in your workflow.
it's unlikely that you'll want to edit every single shot. So here you want to select the best shots to take through to the develop module. When it comes to selecting, shortlisting and marking your shots, there are a few options that you can use. The key ones are color coding, flagging or rating. Although these all do a great job of marking or highlighting your images, I only use the star rating tool at this point as I have other uses for the other two tools. My process is to go through all of the images in loop mode. This gives me the largest view of all the shots. I can then select my favorites using the star rating tool with the aim of selecting the best shot from each location or each type. With the type of photography that I do, when I hand the images over to a client, I want to make sure they have the most impact, which is why I only give them one pose from each location. This means I only use the five star rating tool. I either want to edit that shot or I don't. If after selecting my shots, I have a few from the same location which are similar and I want to pick just one, then I'll select those shots and use the survey mode. This gives me a side by side of the selected shots, allowing me to compare them a little closer and make sure I'm selecting the best shot. Once you have your top shots, make sure you're in grid mode and then you can drop down this little tab. Hit the attribute text and select five stars. This will give you only the five star rated images from that folder, so you can take your best shots onto the develop module. Now that we're in the develop module, you can start editing your images. Start off by correcting the exposure using the sliders under the basic tab. Once you have done this, you can delve a little deeper into the rest of the editing tools. If you're not getting everything you need from the sliders in the basic tool, then take a look at the tone curve. With this tool you can set anchor points in the areas that you want to work on and drag these to change the balance and exposure to a look that you want. Approach correctly and this allows you to maintain a more realistic look through the full tonal range of your shot. Remember to keep an eye on your histogram at the top to make sure you're not losing any of the peaks above the box as that is information that is lost in your image. If you're looking to increase the sharpness of your shot I'd recommend using the clarity tool first as this doesn't introduce noise into the image. If not, then the sharpness tool should be used sparingly. Just remember, if you didn't nail focus, this tool isn't going to work for you. A little tip for when using this tool is to click the little cross box in the top left tab and select the area of your image you want to check for sharpness. Now you can increase the sharpness whilst monitoring the focused area of the shot. If you're finding that noise is being introduced, then either step back a little with the sharpness or use the noise reduction tool. Again, slide this up in small amounts, otherwise your image will start to look muddy. During the import section of this video, I mentioned that you can add some basic camera and lens specific changes to the shot. To do this, open the lens corrections tab and tick the enable profile corrections box. Based on the camera and lens's metadata, this will apply some minor adjustments to the image, correcting things like distortion and vignetting. Once you've completed an edit that you're happy with, you can move on to the next image. If the next image is similar, or if you want to make a full set of images that have a similar look and feel to them, then you have a couple of options. The first option is to copy the edit so you can paste it onto the next image. You can do this using Control or Command along with Shift and C. This is where a pop-up box will come up, meaning you can tick the relevant boxes to copy from this image. Alternatively, you can create what's called a preset. To do this, click the plus on the left. Again, this brings up a pop-up window where you can select the sections of the edit that you want to copy. Once you've named and saved the preset, you can now move on with your editing. If you want to apply the preset to the next image, or even to a batch of images, select the image that you want, look in the presets to the named preset in the left, and click on that relevant preset. If you have one image that you'd like to do multiple edits of, then the best way to do this is to create a virtual copy of that image. This way it takes up minimal space on your drive and lets you create a completely different look. These virtual copies can also be stacked to keep your film strip tidy. And if you want to see your original image at any time, then just hit the backslash key to toggle this view. Well, that's the develop module. And after all of your images are edited, it's time to go back to the library tool to export. The basics of exporting have already been covered in the previous video, and they don't really change depending on your skill level. But if you have any questions, drop them in the comment section below. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you want to find out a little bit more about Lightroom, then make sure you check out the rest of the series on the WEX social channels.